Okay, uh, I think I have the green light. So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Billy Lynch, and today we are going to be talking about identity-based source integrity. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a software engineer over at ChainGuard, uh, where we do sort of all things software supply chain security. Uh, I'm also a maintainer for some open source projects like uh, Tecton Chains, as well as SigStore's GitSign, which we'll go into a little bit more uh, today. So this talk is going to be sort of all about supply chain security. It's a big hot topic at the moment, um, but sort of what does that mean? Uh, we like to think it's all sunshine and rainbows and that we have this nice pipeline where we start from our source and go to our build. And then from our build, we then package it up and then send it to our, our production servers. Uh, in reality, though, it's a little bit of a mess. Um, and we can sort of look at that same graph and we can see all of these different points uh, where things can go wrong. And it's a bit chaotic. Uh, but for this talk, what we're really going to be focusing on is this source component on the left. So what are some of the compromises there? Uh, how can we sort of make improvements with code signing, uh, stuff like that? So this is, this is a real problem. Uh, we've seen many instances in the wild where people are uh, impersonating commits, um, pushing malicious packages, uh, source repositories being compromised. Uh, and we want to be able to detect and mitigate these attacks uh, with software signing. So code signing is something that's existed in Git for years and years now. Um, and so it comes up whenever we have these problems. It's like, oh, could, have, could code signing have solved these? Um, and so there's a lot of reasons to do code signing. Um, so normally, Git, the data that's stored in your Git commit is really just text. Uh, what's stored in the author? What's stored in the committer? It's a name and an email. But you can modify those just by modifying your Git config messages. So what commit signing allows you to do is basically have additional metadata about the commits um, backed by a uh, public-private key pair so that you can then verify the data and make sure it hasn't been tampered with. Uh, by doing this, you have some information that's more trustworthy than the, just that simple string. And what's also useful about it is you're storing information in a secondary source that's separate from your repo. And so if you uh, want to attack basically a signed commit, not only do you have to compromise the source rep repo, but you have to compromise the keys as well. And so having those two work in tandem gives you a lot more benefits from a security standpoint. Uh, one thing I will note here that that code signing does not prevent, uh, which we won't go too much into detail uh, for this talk, is code signing does not stop a malicious user who is authorized. Uh, from making a bad change. So this is, you know, disgruntled open source maintainer decides, that, hey, we're going to start pushing malware into our libraries now. Uh, that is also a concern for software supply chain, but not something we're going to be focused on here today. So a uh, quick overview on how this works if you haven't used commit signing before. Uh, there's a dash s, dash uppercase s uh, flag to grip, uh, cryptographically signed commits. Uh, this is not to be confused with dash lowercase s, which is for uh, DCO sign off. Uh, which has a different purpose. Uh, and this will allow you, you configure it in Git, you tell it what uh, key pair to use. Typically, this has been GPG, but uh, in recent years, you can also use SSH keys as well as X509 certificates to sign. And Git also has hooks to verify those commits as well. You can just say Git verify commit, give it the revision, it'll check those signatures, and it'll tell you pass or fail. So uh, this is CDCon, GitOpsCon. So you know, one question we want to ask ourselves is, hey, how do we use this in our GitOps pipelines? Uh, being able to commit back to a repository is something that's very common within GitOps workflows. You can imagine hydrating manifests, populating some data, some configuration information, resolving those, pushing back the, uh, that to an uh, infrastructure repo before we then deploy that out to our production systems. So, it would be nice if we start signing our commits so we have more verifiable uh, metadata about where these things came from. So there's sort of two approaches I see most commonly for GitOps pipelines and signing. Uh, one of them is sort of bring your own key. So this is where you provision a long lift key, usually in a, in a key management system, Vault, a Cloud KMS system, uh, Kubernetes secrets, uh, and you make that available to, to your CICD pipeline in, with, uh, via some mechanism. Uh, the other thing that we see pretty commonly is uh, this is GitHub only, uh, though I think there are some plans to adapt this for other uh, source forges as well. 
uh, GitHub has this special key called webflow.gpg uh, that you may or may not know about. Uh, so GitHub, whenever you do any sort of API operation, any UI operation, when you hit that squash button in the UI, um, it will actually sign your commit data with its own key. Uh, it can't use your private key because GitHub shouldn't have access to your private key. So what they do instead is they authorize you and say, okay, you're signed into GitHub. We know who you are. Uh, we're going to sign it with our own key so you have that verified check mark uh, and that signature attached to your commits. However, there's a lot of challenges when it comes to commit signing. Um, you know, it is very possible to do this all correctly, but there's a lot of steps that you need to take in order to have a good security stance. So things like, are you encrypting your keys? Or when you generated it, did you just hit enter, 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 and moved on? Uh, are you rotating your keys frequently? Ideally, you should be doing this every couple months. Um, you know, how often are, are you rotating this in practice? Uh, if a key of yours is out in the wild, how would you know about this? How would you detect this? Um, if you have a case where you do need to revoke a key, what's that process? How do you notify your downstream clients to no longer trust that key? And then finally, there's, there's something interesting that's a little more uh, philosophical, uh, which was sort of the whole uh, idea behind this talk, which is a lot of the times we make this assumption that a key equates to identity. You have your, your GPG key. We have our production uh, release key. Uh, but is that always true? And is that a strong assertion of identity? So if we look at uh, sort of the bring your own key model, where are you storing this key? Who has access to it? If it's stored in your KMS system, does your, do your developers have access to this key? Could they just download it and then sign whatever they wanted? Sort of an insider risk um, sort of threat. Again, how often is it rotated? Are you sort of taking good hygiene for, for managing your keys? And do you have a disaster recovery plan for not if, but really when it leaks? Um, because we always want to be prepared for the worst when we're sort of modeling our security uh, threats. And same thing for webflow.gpg, even though that's a key, not a key that you yourself manage, um, there's sort of a big problem here, which is everyone uses the same key. Um, you'll see on, on that verified check mark, there's, it's like 4AEE. Uh, that is the same key that's used for everyone across from GitHub. Um, and before, you know, I mentioned some of the benefits for commit signing, having uh, that piece of data that's separate from your commit content. Uh, using the Webflow key kind of breaks down that barrier a little bit because now we're trusting GitHub for both serving the content but also providing that key. Um, and you know, if you want to take that as part of your, your trust model and say, hey, we trust GitHub, maybe that's fine. Uh, but it does sort of open yourself to a, a little bit of more risk uh, if there was ever a problem uh, where we can no longer trust GitHub. Another thing worth calling out is GitHub doesn't necessarily have the best uh, visibility into identities. Uh, Git uses emails for uh, its commit data for authors and committers, but it doesn't really know, like, do you still have access to an email? So for example, um, it was on a slide before, uh, before I was at Chingard, I was at Google. So I have an at google.com email still associated to my GitHub account. GitHub doesn't know I don't, I don't work at Google anymore. And there's actually some reasons why you would want that email still associated because all of my commits when I was at Google, we still wanna be able to verify and we still wanna be able to check. Uh, but there's nothing stopping me from going and making a commit with my at google.com email even though I no longer have access to it, and I'll still get that verified check mark. GitHub has no idea. It just knows that it was verified and associated to my account at some point in time. And then when I was putting this slide, uh, when I was putting this deck together, uh, there's also this interesting behavior when you start using some CI CD automation, particularly with GitHub Actions. So remember before, the webflow.gpg key is used whenever you use an API operation and you don't try to include uh, any signing uh, metadata or material with it. So you can actually use the GitHub Actions GitHub token, and you can just make a commit in GitHub Actions, and by default, you will get this committer that just says GitHub Actions bot. Uh, this ID is just the ID of the GitHub Actions app, and this is true for any GitHub Actions that you run, and uh, you get a commit that just looks like this. And so to me, this, this, this worries me, because you know, how can this be used in sort of malicious ways? How do you know that this is sort of the correct GitHub actions? Is it coming from your repo? Is it coming from uh, another repo? 
without having sort of finer grain metadata and more I, uh, data about the identity and where it's coming from, it's much more uh, difficult to make these decisions on do we trust this change, do we trust this commit? So that sort of raises the question, how do we deal with imposters? How do we sort of deal with this? And so software supply chain, again, is a sort of big area. So one of the things you know, that makes sense to do is what are other people doing? Uh, this is sort of focused on source, but there's also been a large focus on software supply chain for um, just artifacts in general, deploying to prod, container image, packages. Uh, and so that's where we're really gonna start talking about SIGSTOR. So SIGSTOR is an, another open source project under the open SSF. Uh, its whole goal is to make uh, signing software and artifacts as easy as possible, lower the barrier of entry. And one of the really nice things with SIGSTOR, there's a tool called Cosign, which sort of popularized this concept called keyless signing, uh, which allows you to sign artifacts using identities rather than just keys, um, long-lived keys that you sort of need to trust for, for a long period of time. Uh, there are still keys under the hood. Uh, it's more like ephemeral signing. Uh, but by doing this, we can sort of have a lot more metadata, a lot more fine-grained details about the user identities that are being used to sign these artifacts. So we've been seeing a ton of adoption on, on SIGSTOR uh, with Cosign. Uh, there's also been support added to uh, PyPI, as well as GitHub just announced uh, a week or two ago about uh, public beta for NPM provenance using SIGSTOR. Um, we also have a ton of open source projects using SIGSTOR to sign their own releases. Uh, Tekton, which I'm also a maintainer for, uses um, Cosign to sign their releases. Kubernetes uses it, as well as CPython, a bunch of other uh, projects as well. Um, yeah, so we've been seeing a ton of adoption on the six door side. So then, going back to this chaotic graph from before, uh, you'll notice if you look at some of the source threats uh, on the left side here, and you look at some of the build threats on the packaging side here, you'll see uh, sort of a similarity between the two, right? So on the source side, submit unauthorized change. On the, on the package side, upload modified package. Compromise source repo, compromise package repo build from modified source, use compromised package. And so the question is, can we sort of take the model of SIGSTOR and what we're using for packages and artifacts and apply that for source signing? And that's really where the concept of git sign comes from, which does exactly that. Let's apply SIGSTOR, but model it for git commit signing so we can have that richer uh, identity metadata uh, in order to make these smarter policy decisions about our source code. Because really, when you think about it, for GitOps pipelines, you know, if our packages and our containers, uh, we want to be able to sign and verify for our production workloads, our source code is really our inputs for our GitOps pipelines, our CI/CD pipelines. So we should be treating this with the same level of security and signing that we do for everything else. So, how does this work? Um, so there's a few different pieces that work here. Uh, so it all starts from the tooling, whether this is Cosign, NPM. Git sign, it all starts from a client. And what, we, what we're really doing for identity is we're relying on OIDC, uh, OpenID Connect, which is a layer on top of OAuth. And so what we're doing here is the tools going off and saying, hey, I need to get an uh, ID token. If it's a human user, we just send them through the, the very typical OAuth 2 flow. So open up the web browser, you know, hit uh, sign in with Google, sign in with GitHub, uh, get that token, return it back. What the client will also do is generate an ephemeral key pair uh, on the fly. So it'll generate a brand new private key, public key pair. Uh, it will sign some challenge to basically prove that it has access to that public key. And what it will do is it will send this data to a component of SIGSTOR called Fulcio, which is a certificate authority uh, that will look at that data, look at the public key, look at the OIDC token, verify that the OIDC token is valid, uh, and if everything checks out, uh, it will issue you back a code signing cert, a short-lived code signing cert that's only valid for 10 minutes. And so you can sign whatever you want in that 10-minute window, uh, git commits, OCI images, uh, whatever you want. And then finally, whatever we do sign, because typically when you do certificate-based signing, uh, you can only use it during the, the period where it's valid. Uh, in order to verify things well after the fact, after it's expired, Anything that we sign, we put on a service called Recor, which is also part of the SIGSTOR project, which is a transparency log, uh, that we can, which is a append-only immutable store, where we can store these signatures and store these usage as well as the, the certificates. 
so that later on when we have a git commit, even if it was from months ago, we can say, hey, Recore, was this commit actually signed at this time? And that becomes our immutable log to do that verification well after the fact. So these are open source components that you can run yourself. Uh, the six door project also runs public instances for free that any open source project can use. Um, and so this is what like Kubernetes and Tekton are using for all their open source deployments. So everything is auditable so you can go and query where all the signatures are coming from and it gives a lot more transparency into build processes and signing processes. So uh, I mentioned certificates. So this is one example of certificate. So this is from a commit that I just pulled myself. Uh, so for human workflows, uh, really what this comes down to is, hey, what's your email? Um, and where was this issued from? So in this case, we have my email, billy at chingar.dev, uh, and this was issued by um, G Suite, so accounts.google.com. Uh, you can see here also, you know, look at the not before and not after. You see only valid for 10 minutes and only to be used for code signing. So we can't use this for, you know, arbitrary web hosting, stuff like that. So the question then becomes for uh, automated workflows, we don't actually have a user email, right? Your GitHub action doesn't have an at github.com email address that we can use. Um, and this is where OIDC really shines. So OIDC is a, is a very flexible spec and a lot of uh, CICD providers and cloud providers in general uh, actually provide OIDC tokens for their runtime environments. So this is true for DCP VMs, uh, this is true for, you know, Amazon, Azure, uh, GitHub Actions, GitLab, uh, CircleCI. Uh, they're providing OIDC tokens that you can use and hook into that actually give you uh, finer information about the environment that you're running in. So this is one example of a GitHub Action token uh, that I pulled from just the, the uh, GitHub documentation. Uh, but you can see here, unlike the example we saw before with the GitHub Actions email where it's just, you know, GitHub Actions ID at, you know, whatever, no reply email. Uh, we actually have more finer grain information, such as the ref, uh, the SHA that it ran at, the repository it's running in, uh, what run attempt is this, what workflow file are we using? And so this becomes a much richer source of data where we can start making smarter policy decisions on individual CI runs uh, rather than just, you know, sort of holistic emails. And so Sigstore will handle these as well. So this is an example of a certificate that was generated from a GitHub Actions workflow. And we can see here from some of the fields that are taken out, we extract the issuer, we extract where it's coming from. So we can say, was this a push? Was this a pull request? Was this a manual run? Um, what was the workflow name, uh, ref branch, things like that. And this gives us a lot more control. So a quick demo. Um, I'm going to kick this off because this takes a little bit to run. So I'm going to show a GitHub Actions run, but while that runs, I can also show the local workflow. And hopefully this is big enough. Um, so it's pretty easy to get started. So if you just, uh, all you really need to do is, is install the git sign binary, add it to your path. And then all you really need to do is set two uh, required fields that basically just says, hey, git, uh, please use git sign for my signing program, as well as, you know, this is an X509 type certificate signing uh, model. Um, there's a few other config settings you can see here that just configures behavior of git sign, but those are optional. They're not really required. And then all we need to do is, you know, make a commit as normal. Give it a meaningful message. And what's gonna happen, uh, it's gonna open up a browser uh, window. It, you're not gonna see it here because it's, it's in the background. And it, since I'm already signed in, it already knows, hey, you're signed in with Google and it makes the commit signature, uh, everything else. And we can see here, we have this transparency log entry added. And so git sign verify, uh, the git verify commit will work. Um, however, git verify commit only looks at the keys. It doesn't actually look at identity information. And so what we also have in git sign is the ability to do sort of finer grain verification, not only of the key itself, but also the account information included here. So here is just for a human user, it's what, what is the, um, the issuer, what is the identity. And so we can run that and verify that and it will do all the checks for, for recore and everything else. 
And the idea is you know, very easy, very simple. And this just generated a new key under the hood on the fly. And so now, so this is the six door auth page that opened up in the backgrounds. And yeah, so now we have a GitHub action that was done. And all this really did was, uh, it, just made a, it just made a commit. Uh, it didn't do anything too special. Um, but what we can do here, because this is a little, we can grab the commit SHA and uh, Sixdoor has this really nice UI where you can just query the record log. Uh, theoretically, you can monitor the log for every single instance where your email is being used or when your production workflow is being used to sign things. And we can just look up by commit SHA what that just made. And we can say, hey, this was created two minutes ago. Um, this hash doesn't, it's actually a hash of a hash, which isn't super useful. Uh, but we can see here in the, in the certificate issued by Sigstore, you know, it's still technically valid, but as far as git sign is concerned, once it's signed that commit, it threw that key away. That key never even hit disk. It's only stored in memory, used for that one event, never to be used again. So as far as I'm concerned, it's lost, it's rotated, we don't need to worry about it. And we can see all of the, uh, the information here, so it's a little more verbose than what we saw before in that small example. But same information, you know, issued by tokens.actions.githubusercontent.com. Um, here is the actual individual workflow that was ran, including the ref, um, the commit information, the URI, um, the fact that it was ran from a workflow dispatch, stuff like that. And so what this allows us to do, if we get pull the latest, get sign verify, Had this in my history. Um, all right, this looks a little gnarly, but it is hopefully correct. Uh, I had it here somewhere. Demo was, uh, yeah. So we can verify the same thing, but now we're doing more than just the email identity. We, we can actually have policy that says, hey, this came from Ref's Heads Main, this came from a workflow dispatch. And if we wanted to do something like, hey, did this come from a push events? Typo, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this will actually fail validation. So we can start making smarter decisions about push versus pull request versus manual run versus anything else. And because this is all bound by OIDC identities, uh, what's really nice about this is I, I as a developer can't fake this unless I direct access to GitHub's OIDC token issuer service. So if I had the ability to run arbitrary things on my CI workflow, maybe I could get around it. But normally as a developer, I need to go through my normal processes. Um, and this is really, really powerful as, as a policy control tool for, for CI CD. Cool, uh, so just to review some of the pros and cons, uh, I'll start with the cons. So a uh, common piece of feedback we get if you use Git sign in practice is you actually won't see the, the green verify check mark. Uh, it is something that you know we do talk to GitHub and GitLab about uh, quite a bit. Um, and really what it boils down to is how Git sign approaches signing and verification is very, very different than what's traditionally been done. Normally for GitHub, uh, when you wanna verify, when you wanna associate a key to your account, you go into your profile settings, you add the key. But in this case, with key lists, there is no key to add. We actually don't know what the private key is, so we can't actually do that. And so there are some changes that need to be made to verifiers in order to do this more identity-based verification. Um, and those just aren't, aren't in uh, sort of production GitHub uh, or GitLab at the moment. Another thing worth calling out is um, you saw some of the metadata that was included in the certificates. All of that goes onto the public transparency log. Uh, so if you're using the public SIG store instance and you're uncomfortable with that data being present, um, that may not be the best fit for you if you're concerned about repository names or branch names or identities like that. Uh, so that might mean you need to run your own instance. Um, but again, all these components are open source. Uh, so you do have the tools to run your own instance if you need to. Uh, but there are a ton of pros, right? So again, no private keys. I don't need to worry about protecting this lonely key. Uh, I don't need to worry about that leaking out. And even if it does leak out, because that key is only valid, it's bound to that certificate for 10 minutes, that drastically reduces uh, the time where that key can be exploited. Um, 
So even if you detect, oh, hey, oops, we accidentally locked our key, as long as it's 10 minutes past, you can guarantee that key could no longer be used to sign uh, valid data anymore. And so that just puts you in a much better position in terms of responding to security events whenever they come up. Uh, signatures are tied to runtime identities. The fact that you need to go and get a fresh OIDC token and a valid OIDC token in order to sign anything uh, means that that email case that we saw before of, oh, hey, I can you know, sign things with that at Google.com, I can't actually do this in this workflow, and I can't go get a key for my CICD workload uh, easily. Uh, so that gives you a little bit more trust in that identity rather than just assuming that a key is one-to-one -to, -one to an identity. Uh, and then finally, all of its usage, since it's uploaded to the transparency log, you can monitor that. And if there's ever any case where something pops up, it's like, oh, hey, your production identity is being used for an artifact or a signature that you don't actually know about. That's a signal for you that maybe something funky is going on, and it gives you some telemetry for where to investigate uh, and where to look. So uh, that's all I had. Uh, here's some contact information if you want to reach out. Uh, here is the link for the GitSign project if you want to get involved or have any questions. Star is always appreciated. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Mike. So with keyless signing, um, if you suspect that at some period of time that maybe someone managed to get a hold of your identity and like, got your password, and you, like, let's say you did the bad thing and you don't have 2FA enabled on your email or things like that, um, and they were able to start signing things with your identity. Um, what can you do in that situation? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, one of the nice things, because you're getting a fresh key every time, um, you know, you could try to revoke every single key, uh, but the safer thing to do is basically say, okay, we don't know when this was compromised, so we're not gonna trust anything before this period of time. And you can know that, you can have that as a policy that basically says any commit, anything made, with this identity before this period of time, we're no longer gonna trust. Uh, the other thing that you can do is because keys are now unique per instance, is you can just revoke the artifact, you can just remove the artifacts that they signed um, because you know what they're tied to based on the signatures. Uh, easier said than done for like OCI images, stuff like that. Git commits obviously much harder uh, because Git itself is a Merkle tree. Um, but yeah, you, you would look for, um, revoking the artifacts or identifying those artifacts that those signatures are, are tied to. Um, but at least you have that point in time and you know exactly which artifacts that those would point to. Uh, but you do raise a good point that uh, this keyless signing is sort of predicated on uh, account security and having two-factor auth enabled. Um, so there is sort of a weak point there. Uh, but the, the argument is people do a much better job securing their own personal email accounts and sort of pushes, like GitHub requires 2FA now for all their accounts. And it's much easier to lower the barrier of entry and require those for sort of more safe um, account and identity management than it is to say, hey, make sure you do all these things for all your GPG keys and SSH keys and everything else. So it is, it is a trade-off. Thank you.